Welcome to Blind Abilities. I'm Jeff Thompson. In collaboration with Jack Chen, we present to you a podcast from Excel Ability. There's always a positive, and, and just make sure you're spending as much time focusing on the positive as you are trying to deal with the negative. Empowering excellence and success for people with disabilities. And that's how I go about my life is asking that question, not can I do it, but how can I do it? Jack Chen delivers talks and training to corporations and organizations on empowering success for people with disabilities. If you have a disability, you understand that you're just going to have to be better than the competitor. That's it. You're just going to have to be better. You can find out more about Accelerability and their team on the web at www.teamaccelerability.com. And they may actually learn something and make your interactions with them far more comfortable if you're, in fact, willing to disclose that you may need to do something uh, different than most other people do. Now, an Excel Ability podcast from Jack Chen. Welcome to the Excel Ability podcast. This is a brand new series of conversations on success with people who happen to have a disability. Together, we'll uncover the attitudes, habits, techniques, and practices that enable these individuals to achieve astounding success. I was born legally blind with retinitis pigmentosa and cone rod dystrophy. And going through life up to my college years, that's when I was given the gift of macular degeneration. It was because I took a first step that was so hard, but I didn't realize it at the time that by doing that and I unshackled myself from all safety and security that I knew, I knew I could do other things. Nobody hires social studies teachers who are blind because they don't coach football. (laughs) Challenges, you need to be challenged. The world is not a safe place and you shouldn't want it to be. I moved to Austin, Texas because my buddy had a job for me selling door to door. A blind guy selling door to door. Mm -hmm. Yes, the short film writes itself. Welcome to another episode of the Accelerability Podcast. I'm your host, Jack Chen. Today we have the pleasure of hearing from composer Steve Letness. Steve has written and produced a number of albums of his own piano music. Recently, Steve's composing work has focused on the area of film scoring, in which he produces musical accompaniment to various movies. Steve is the only visually impaired composer in the industry. Steve has scored dozens of movies of various lengths, including one from Sony Pictures called Santa's Boot Camp. Steve has gained a wealth of lessons, techniques, and attitudes that have helped him to achieve incredible success. I'm excited to share this conversation on success with you today. Please feel free to contact Team Accelability to share your comments, questions, or feedback, or to share your own story with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find information about this podcast and previous and future episodes at www.teamaccelability.com. That's www.teamexcelability.com. You can follow us on Facebook at Team Accelability or on Twitter at Team Accelability. Hey, Steve, thanks so much for being available and chatting with us today. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say about the area of disability and success. You've had such an interesting and illustrative career. So thank you so much for taking the time out and being with us. Hey, Jack, it's nice to be here. Awesome. All right, well, let's get started. Can you describe your disability and describe for those folks out there who may not be already familiar with what it's like to have your disability? Sure. Well, I was born legally blind. Uh, so the numbers were 20 by 200. And funny thing was, I was born and they thought I had cerebral palsy because I had delayed growth. I had delayed everything. Nobody knew that I couldn't see well. And so I didn't speak at the right time or walk at the right time. And then it was my babysitter who informed my parents 
said, hey, can you, maybe you should check this kid's eyes out. And they did. And poof, you know, that was, that was the, that was a solution. And so I was born legally blind with retinitis pigmentosa and cone rod dystrophy. And so like I, I could never drive, you know, I still, well, still can't. And going through life up to my college years, that's when I was given the gift of macular degeneration. And so I had to relearn how, uh, as my sight diminished over the next few years. And I believe it's tapered off. So there were almost like two stages <laughs> of a Saturn rocket. You know? Like first, you know, I, I, it was, you know, I, I could... I could function on 20 by 200. Like I really felt like, you know, I could compete with people at 20 by 200. I had a few assistive technologies, you know, to help, you know, uh, you know, my friends that had great people around me. But after I got macular degeneration, that was another level of development and relearning and adjusting to a new set of circumstances for my disability. So how that affects me day to day, <laughs> I check for traffic. Uh, that's, that's high on the list. Um, here in Minnesota during the winter months, everybody uses the skyways, you know, that are little walkways between all the buildings cause it can get 40 below, but I use it year round, you know, because I don't like walking through traffic. And I remember watching a video with you in it saying how by the time you got to work and all the traveling that you had to do, it felt like you'd already had a full day. And man, that spoke right to me. Um, how do I work efficiently? Because the human brain, we're here to work as efficiently as possible. So whatever we want to focus on for the day, we want to get there as soon and as efficiently as possible. And so we make paths, we make safety paths, it's secure. How can we do that so we can save the energy for later? And so I use Skyways a lot. But as far as day to day stuff, I mean, I have assistive technology called Zoom Text, which is a screen reader and screen magnifier. So when I work on films, you know, I can zoom in closely and see what's going on. And the iPad and iPhone has transformed how I live and work. And it's a much easier strain. There's less strain on my eyes because I have things read to me and that just saves me and that delays that daily exhaustion that we can feel depending on the type of work we have to do that day. And so for your eyesight, how would you describe what you can see right now? The best way I've managed to figure it out is if someone with good vision picked up a Ziploc bag and it was slightly, and it was hazy. You know? It almost looked like it was from Poltergeist. Like anywhere you looked, it was fuzzy. That's how the center of my vision is. And so I use what's called eccentric viewing. So when I'm sitting across the table from somebody and I'm looking straight at them, it's a blur. They are a blur. I'm looking to the ether of humanity. It could be Shaquille O'Neal. It could be the Dalai Lama. I can't tell. So I look to the left or I look to the right, and then I look back at center after I have honed in where they are by looking to the left or to the right. And so you can't make out someone's face sitting across the table. You couldn't recognize them, right? Not necessarily. Okay. Uh, you know, I would have to. I would have to be a little closer, and so that's why, honestly, I listen to people's gates, like how they walk, or the way to hear their voice, and you know, and then I can pinpoint them, and then and then walk right there. I've gotten used to people, friends who like to honk their horns at me because I can't see their cars, and so when they come pick me up, I know everybody's car horn, and and that certainly helps. What a fantastic way to find an adaptation. That's that's really unique. We got to do what we got to do to survive, man. Well, you know what? Now you know the sound of a horn for a BMW versus a Ford Mustang. So <laughs> I'm going to test you one of these days. I'm going to send you an audio clip. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, Steve, you're a composer. Explain to us what you do for work. I write music for movies. So what that means is what they call underscore. So when there's a production and a director and a producer and an editor, they, they all want to uh, have music to support a story in your TV show or your film. They hire a dude or somebody or a gal to write the music underneath it. And that's my role. I could write for a two hour movie. I could write maybe 90 minutes of music and it takes me a few months to do that. But I support the story on screen by providing music that helps set mood, tone, you know, prefacing a scene or the lingering emotions thereafter. So when the guy walks in 
the room with the knife. That's when the the big sound comes out. That's that's the kind of thing you support. That's right. It's when a uh, super low low timpani or a, or a bassoon starts playing with some low cellos and bass, you know, accompaniment. When some, you know, at least in the scene that you yeah. just described. And where might our listeners have heard some of your work? Where might they be familiar with what you've done? I did a, a World War II documentary for the state of Luxembourg last year with director Michel Tariba, and I've done several films from Italy, but this past year was a real boon. I'd worked on a family Christmas film called Santa's Boot Camp. This Christmas, look good, Santa. Something will happen that has never happened before. Your rosy cheeks. Newsflash, kiddos. Santa isn't real. Santa's Boot Camp. Coming soon. After a couple years of uh, shopping it around, we got picked up by Sony Pictures. It was just released, you know, just a short while ago, uh, all through North America. So it's was, it was, it's been fun having friends and family and strangers take photos walking through WalMarts and Targets and Barnes and Nobles and uh, on-demand shots of people saying, "Hey, look what I found in my store," you know, um, <laughs> which is just really cool. That's a, that is a, a really neat feeling, and uh, and then people turning it on the back and seeing that block of credits on the bottom and then finding your name and saying, hey, I saw you, I saw you, you know, and uh, so it's it's really cute. And uh, having the nieces and nephews like it. So if you got kids or if you're young and you like family Christmas films, you know, that that is a holiday film that will be and what we call an evergreen film. So it will be out every year for years to come because it's a holiday movie. That's a great legacy to have and something just fun to have on your, your resume, if you will. Tell us why it is important to have good film music. It's about story. It's about characters and both of their development. It's how I can support the man and woman on screen to help tell their story. And sometimes that means music. And sometimes it also knows when not to have any at all. It's all about story, but that's why discussions with directors and with producers and uh, with editors is very important. Communication is one of the biggest things that will, will help you out in this business is understanding someone else's purpose, setting ego aside, and serving a greater good, a greater story. Communication, that's such an important thing. Let's rewind a little bit. Can you talk a little bit about when you first realized that you had vision loss and it made you different and what impact it had on you socially, emotionally, or otherwise? When I was younger, I was very prideful. And so I didn't want people to know I was blind. I was embarrassed about it. I was ashamed because, you know, of course, there was teasing. One of the biggest memories that I have was being in high school. And I was walking in between buildings at high school. And as I was walking into one building, I heard behind me, about 50 yards behind me, I heard two dudes yell, hey, blind a-hole. And I turn around. Obviously, I couldn't see who they were, but I pretended like I did. And, you know, I gave them the finger and I just walked in and none, none of the other kids did anything. But, you know, I didn't want people to know and I didn't want people to make fun of me. And so I hid it as best I could because I just didn't want to deal with the hassle. And then I was surrounded by a lot of good people my entire life. And nobody ever told me, at least my closest people, that I couldn't do anything. I knew I had issues and I knew I had challenges but I always felt they were achievable some way, somehow. I felt I could accomplish anything when I'm 15 years old because I knew the school that I had or that I went through. I knew the friends that I had. I had a great family. I lived in a great neighborhood and I was surrounded by people who never shot me down. But honestly, I really noticed I had issues, you know, when I when I got to college, when I came back to Minnesota and I understood because, you know, here I was, you know, a, a plus student in high school and I got to college and the workload was a lot heavier, and I stumbled through college, probably able to read a little less than half of what I had to because there was simply not enough time. I learned what limitations there were in the world, even though it's not the real world, it's still a you know happy, nice little campus. But I started to realize, oh my gosh, I cannot read 80 pages in a night because I have to take them down to the disability office and get them read for me on tape by my buddy, Jeremy Fisher, who would read these things and then I would get them a few days later. And so it was a constant battle of delays, 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 delays. How do I compensate? How do I adjust to get through this college? Because I have... I had never had to handle this much work. I realized I have got to find ways to catch up just to get to where the rest of the world is. 
And then, you know, but then after <laughs> realizing that I got macular degeneration, here's how I learned about macular degeneration and that I knew my eyes were changing. I was on a family trip and we were traveling around Europe and stuff. So we went there and when we were in Geneva, Switzerland, we were walking down a street and my sister ha- uh, was walking out of a boot store. She, she loved her shoes and she loved her capris. And so I was like, I didn't want to have anything to do with going shoe shopping. And so I was walking ahead and she was walking behind me. And in bike paths, they have these three stanchions that stand up so cars can't drive down paths in parks. Well, there were three stanchions, but as I was walking, I only saw two. And so I'm walking, 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 and I turn my head because my sister was walking into another store and magically the center stanchion appeared. <gasps> And I'm like, oh, oh, I didn't see that. I didn't, oh my gosh, you know, and I, I kind of flipped. I was like, what, wait, why, did, why didn't I see that? And I realized something was wrong. You know, it, it's lined up a whole new set of challenges for my 20s. Yeah. Well, talk about some of those challenges and what you did to overcome them. What attitudes, techniques, practices do you feel helped you in your 20s after realizing that you had macular degeneration? After you go through the self-sabotage <laughs> and the, the, the disappointment, you know, then then you learn who your friends are, you learn where your support is, and you learn quickly how to ask for help. So I had this insidious, insidious eye disease that was slowly taking more and more of my vision away. And each year or two, I'd have to adjust again. What that meant was slowly watching my world diminish, not only visually, but also in the world itself. I was going into self-protection mode. I was taking less public transportation. I was going out less. I was hanging out with friends less. Uh, I was working on music less. I stopped it all together. I, uh, my, my world shrank. And like, uh, like a lot of people do is we, we hunker down because we, we, we need security. We need safety. We need to feel good somehow, some way at, as this thing is happening to us. But okay. But then what, because what the mind does is the mind gets tired of being tired. The mind gets sick of feeling like crap. So that's when we learn to reach out. That's how we learn to say, Hey, look, I need help with this. And so that's honestly a big part of it was, was seeing who, who is a true friend. Who could I come to for help? Who is going to be there in my time of need? And I had plenty of friends to do it. A lot of folks who are visually impaired don't have that same perspective that you have, that they get tired of it and they just got to push forward. Is there anything that you think helped you to have that perspective? I went into this kicking and screaming. I tried to do the right thing for the wrong reason. What I mean by that is most of my life I've spent in Minnesota. So what did I do in Minnesota? I established safety and security. I knew the bus routes, I knew the train routes, I knew the skyways, I had all my friends here, I had all my family. I was safe and that's what we need. We need, before we do anything to grow, we have to feel safe, we need a launching pad. But what happened was I fell in love, I was in a relationship for years, we lived here and then she moved away. We were still together long distance, and ultimately we both decided we had to live together to see if this truly was marriage material. So what did I do? I uprooted anything and everything that I knew, and I moved to Massachusetts. And Boston is, well, it's not exactly (laughs) user-friendly. Don't I know it. I, I mean, I it was it's entirely different than Minnesota, but the truth is, Jack, I loved it. It was people were... Friendly, helpful, a bit acerbic. There were a lot of wonky streets, lots of curves, but they had, you know, the tea. I love Boston, but I moved out there and I left everything behind me. Everything I knew. Safety, security, be damned for the sake of love. And I did not want to do it. Like I knew it was the right thing to do, but I, I was kicking and screaming the entire way. But... I had to do it because I had to see, was this the woman I was going to marry? Well, soon thereafter, we learned she wasn't, uh, and I moved away. But here's the thing. I did the hardest thing in my life by moving out there for love. And we came to a decision this wasn't working. So what did I do? I didn't move back to Minnesota. I said, ah, to heck with this. I'll move to Texas. I moved to Austin, Texas because my buddy had a job for me selling door to door. A blind guy selling door to door. Yes, the short film writes itself. But it was so much easier to move 
to Texas because I had already done the hardest part by moving to Massachusetts first. And when a friend of mine, Nate, called me up and said, hey, you know, do you want to move back to Colorado? You know, how are you doing? He learned I was having kind of a crummy time. I jumped at that too. I'm like, hey, I'll move to Colorado. So each of these steps was easier. And what made that change then was I realized, man, I've been able to move across country several times and each time it was easier. What's the reason for this? It was because I took a first step that was so hard, but I didn't realize it at the time that by doing that and I unshackled myself from all safety and security that I knew, I knew I could do other things. It took taking a large leap for the sake of romance to realize that I could do so much. So again, I, that's why I say it's the right thing for the wrong reasons. Awesome. I, I love the fact that you were bold. You took the step. You did something that you didn't even think you perhaps could do, and it was hard, and it proved to be the best thing in the end. What an awesome lesson. Steve, can you talk a little bit about in your younger years, whether you felt your blindness would ever have an impact on your future success? I think when I was younger, I don't think so. I I really didn't because at the time I thought I was going to be a world famous concert pianist and that was that. Again, I had great support around me and I wanted to play the piano. And I knew that through Suzuki, I didn't have to learn to read sheet music. And so in my naive world, I figured I was set. I would just work hard and be a concert pianist and be the fastest piano player in the world. And you know, I think Franz Liszt would have something to say about that. Uh, he was crazy fast. But only it was only as I, as I got older, as I went to college and I left you know, friends and family, that I realized, oh my, I got, I got some serious work to do. And that's where I felt I was going to have some problems. I got a degree in social studies education. And there were two problems that I learned with that. One, I, did, I didn't have any idea what a workload was going to be like for a new teacher creating lesson plans and syllabus, syllabi, and, and, and teaching four to six classes, some of them AP history. I, I started questioning, can I even do this job? And then the other part was, nobody hires social studies teachers who are blind because they don't coach football. <laughs> and you've mentioned this several times so i wanted to make sure I, I touched on this topic you've mentioned people a number of times people and support can you talk a little bit about the people in your life that have supported you and in what way they were supportive because i think it's such an important concept because our lives as people with different types of disabilities, there are parts of our lives, not all parts of our lives, but there are parts of our lives that are simply harder than others. What we have to understand is when we ask for help or we're getting support from people, bear in mind that we're not going to get the exact support we think we should be getting. We are only going to get support from people who know how to give the way they know how to give. We need to be mindful of that. So what, what does that mean? When you go to state services for the blind, that governmental organization is going to have a certain few paths that they believe are the way they can help you. And you have to take that for what it's worth. And when your friends are there to support you, you have to understand you can't get mad when you need to go grocery shopping and they can't do it for another three days. You know, they they are going to help you the way they know how. My parents do the same thing. You know, they support me the way they know how, which is why support has to come through many different threads and different people provide different kinds of support. Just like the normals out there, man. I mean, we all have different friends that we go to for for different reasons. It's no difference. We just, you know, use it in our purposes to help facilitate our our challenge, our sight challenge or our physical challenge or, you know, whatever whatever our, our challenge might be. You need to figure out how people are going to help you by learning how to ask. Because at the end of the day, if people aren't going to help you, get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Just dismiss them outright. If you are are afraid of asking someone for help because they might give you grief or they might not want to, or, you know, it's just remove them from your life because there are plenty of people that will. And remember, there are far more good people than bad people in this world. The evidence bears it out as we are all still here. Phenomenal wisdom there where you're right. If you're going to ask someone for help, you got to accept them for what they can give you and then build that network to to find more people who can help in the ways that you, you need it to fill in the gaps. 
But also, I have a close friend named Nick Worth. He keeps me grounded. He gives me so much crap. When I tell him about, hey, I got a movie coming out from Sony Pictures, he's like, you really think people are going to see that thing? And what he does, he is my comic relief. He is the one that keeps me grounded because the other way that, that people help you is keep you grounded and don't walk delicately around you. You want people to treat you exactly the way they treat everybody else. And what that means is people need to stop holding your hand and you need to stop asking them to hold your hand because what that turns into is its own kind of discrimination. We want to be treated equally like everybody else. Well, guess what? That means there is good and there is bad that comes with this. And the way we are going to flourish in this world is to understand and how to know how to navigate both avenues, good and bad. And so what my friend Nick does, he would die for me. I'd only kill for him. I wouldn't die for him, but he would die for him. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, he's a good guy. <laughs> You know, we would, we, we hang out a lot. He is, he's got so much wisdom, but what he does is he gives me grief and he messes with me and it is the best because he's one of the few people in this world that doesn't treat me any differently. And so that is why I love that guy. I'm normal. I'm when, when I'm with him, I'm like everybody else. And that is a great feeling that we should, that we should all want to want to have around us. You know, you got to stand on your own two feet. Everyone else in the world does it. You got to stand on your own two feet if you want to be treated like everybody else. So, Steve, how did you get into music, and did that present any challenges for you at the time? Well, there are two levels of music in my life. I'd say younger was more more piano stuff and development early on, and then there was also the film music side. Let's start with the earlier one first, because we'll get into the film stuff, I think, a little bit later. My parents were, were musical people. My, my mom sang. My grandparents sang. My grandfather played the organ. My father was a 12-string guitarist with an operatic voice. He's amazing. And so my parents were, were pretty musical, but like my father is a pastor. And so using his voice and using his guitar in outdoor ministry was a part of the gig. And so they always knew how important music was. And so when I was four, I could finally get some fingers working somewhat nimbly. And I, you know, got, got tired of biting toy blocks and playing with trains. You know, they said, well, let's, let's put them on the violin. So, and since I couldn't see well, and we knew that now, they put me on the Suzuki method, which is all by ear. It's all training by ear. So you learned all the Happy Farmer and all those, you know, Suzuki books up through books six. I did the violin for several years and then moved to piano and then just continued that and then learning, you know, the Chopin's and Rachmaninoff's and Tchaikovsky's and Debussy's and Kabalevsky's, you know, through junior high. What, what changed it for me was playing at a talent show. And so I was going to play my Rachmaninoff piece by Prelude in C sharp minor. Prelude in C sharp minor. This is my first foray into playing in front of my peers, and it opened my my eyes to what the power of music was and how you could share and take people on a journey and and play with their emotions too. Something you know, and uh, and that's what I learned. But I was 15, and that's when I when I really understood how important music was going to play a role in my life. And music then changed from recitals and playing Rachmaninoff pieces to writing my own. I started writing music and putting out CDs 
in my teen, teen years. So Steve, how does someone who's visually impaired learn to play pieces when you can't even read the sheet music? Thank you, uh, Mr. Suzuki. I never knew a world where I felt like it was a setback that I couldn't read sheet music. One, my, my parents nor my teachers never admonished me for not being able to read sheet music. Um, obviously, I'm blind. Who's, who's, who's going <laughs> to ridicule a blind kid about not reading sheet music? Uh, I'll leave that to other ignorant musicians later in my life who would admonish me for it. You know, it was all the Suzuki method, learning the right hand, learning the left hand, and then putting them together. Whenever I heard pieces, and so ever from an early age, I unwittingly, unknowingly, whether I knew it or not, I would listen to something and be able to pick it up and play it, whether it was dream theater tunes or metal tunes. I could just pick up and listen to anything and play it, but that only came through practice. And it's, it's, it's nothing that you or I or anybody else can't learn. You just have to learn how to listen and then you can pick up stuff because as you do that more, you can pull things apart, you know, and, uh, so that, that's that's why. And so my entire life, I've never felt shortchanged uh, because I couldn't read sheet music. Honestly, I felt bad for people reading sheet music because they're tied to paper in front of them. And all their eyes can do is stare at this paper while their hands move. And they look like these weird creatures that can't move, like their shoulders are stuck in this vice and their hands are dancing all around, their feet are flailing. They look like they're in trouble, Jack. <laughs> How do you write for a medium that's that's mostly visual images as someone who's visually impaired how do you write that music what what's your process i zoom in a lot (laughs) i uh listen to stuff i mean a lot of honestly a lot of films will lead you through voice itself just inflections from people's voice to to get sometimes i might miss a wink in a certain scene that a director might want what they call a hit point so they might want an accent on a certain twitch. But generally, I do have some vision. And so I can see when scenes change. I can see the pacing of a film. I can hear the urgency or I can hear, you know, the cadence of people talking. But I feel like most of the story is is carried a lot through dialogue anyway. And so a lot of that stuff is manageable, but I will still speak to an editor and a director and say, look, are there any key areas that you want me to hit that are very important to you? Get their perspective, their thoughts on it. And thus, they're a part of the process. Of course, they should be. You know, they put it in the film and, and they watch it. And if they're not happy with something, well, they just let you know. So chances are you're not going to miss anything because you're not going to be allowed to. So it's built in that you're not going to miss it. Correct. Can you describe how your disability influenced your film scoring career, whether needing to overcome it or serving as a driver of your work or some other influence of your success? There are two areas that, that are still a challenge, but I feel like I'm compensating because of my vision. Because I do not see well, I can't read sheet music. And one of the biggest lessons in scoring for film is learning from the masters, learning from John Williams, learning from James Horner, learning from Corn Gold, learning from, you name it. And that means listening to film scores and writing them out as you hear them and then comparing them with the original sheet music. I can't do that. And so how do I compensate? That's again, using my brain. That means listening to music and doing my best to recreate that on my computer and then compare that and then give that to somebody and say, Hey, how close do you think I am? I have to compensate because I can't transcribe. I just have to keep listening and keep practicing and, and honestly creating my own, my own sound. Cause ultimately I don't want to sound like John Williams. I want to sound like Steve Letness. But the other part is, is being sight challenged. Guess what? Everything takes me longer to do. There are just some things that take two to three times as long. So in music, when I got into this, everybody was telling me, I was hearing from everybody, you got to be able to compete by getting things on time and you're going to have short windows to get your material into whomever you are beholden to, what they call deliverables. And I was scared to death that I was going to fail in film because I can't compete on a time schedule. I just can't. Or that's at least what I thought when I got started. Because what did that mean? That meant there is no waiting. Most industries aren't going to wait for you. So what do you do? 
Are you going to complain about it or shrug your shoulders and go sit on your couch and grab some Crown Royal and sit in the dark? Or are you going to jump out there and say, look, I'm going to give this a go. And so what that meant was understanding your tools, where things were, creating templates, as in here's an established starting point with the, all the instruments I know that I need. Now I can go. And so it means finessing and harnessing the power of your tools better than anybody else. And then it means being challenged by different directors who will say to you, hey, <laughs> I've got this many projects that need to be done by this date. Can you do it? And in this business, you say yes. It doesn't matter. I mean, unless you are woefully ill-equipped to handle it in this business, the only way you're going to get anywhere is by saying yes, I can help you. Love that t sentiment. Always say yes. Now, kind of dovetailing right there, you had a project where you had to score 30 films in 11 days. How in the world did you get it done? And what did that teach you? When I got through that gauntlet, I knew I could compete with anybody. That was the hardest, hardest thing I had to do because I had never been challenged like that in my life, let alone in a new industry. These were short films. So they were, you know, five to eight minutes long. But I had 30 of them in 11 days. And not only did I have to write the music for them, but I also had to do the editing of the audio and I had to mix it. And so I had to do all of these things. And so what I did is I gave myself a time. I said, all right, I've got to do four of these a day hmm. and I've got to get through all those. And then I had my templates built up for how I was going to mix them. Well, I didn't get much sleep. I'll put it to you that way. Um, <laughs> for 11 days. But what it meant was I am giving myself free range to write whatever I want. I didn't care what the director's notes were. I didn't care what they wanted me to do. I said, look, you are asking so much of me. I'm going to do whatever I want and you're going to be okay with that because we need to get through this. You need my help. I said, yes. So it's up to me to pull through and to deliver. So what that did though, was gave me carte blanche to play with any type of music I wanted, from techno to metal to orchestral to quirky to jazz, whatever I chose to put into them based on what I felt the story called for. But getting through 30 films, when you're forced to do something, you will realize the different types of skills that you have or the different shortcomings that you have. And that's what you want. You need to be challenged to figure out what you're good at and what you're not good at. So you're either not wasting time working on something you shouldn't be, or you're able to sharpen that knife, sharpen that focus into the areas that you can have a bigger impact on, which is why challenges, you need to be challenged. You, the world is not a safe place and you shouldn't want it to be. Let's drill down back to the time when the director called you and said, hey, Steve, this is what I want you to do. What was that like? What was going through your mind? Because I'm sure a lot of us have been in the same position where we're faced with a challenge and we have fear. So tell us what it was like for you. Well, I was scared dead to death. This guy who did it, his name's Ken Feinberg. He's the guy who I ended up scoring the feature film with. Uh -huh. Wink, 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 people. He was a Hollywood actor. He'd been on shows like Buffy, uh, the Vampire Slayer, Star Trek, Charmed. He played a lot of bad, bad dude roles. And he's a big dude and one of the sweetest people I, I know. He was my in and he was giving me a challenge and an opportunity to prove myself. But I was, I was just, I was scared to death. Up to that point, I'd only written for just a couple little short films. But then what do you do with that fear? Do, do you sit there and continue to be fearful or do you get involved and then do you start working? Because what happens when you start working? Well, the fear goes away because your mind has to focus on what's at hand. So once I got that challenge, I was nervous for a few days while I was waiting for these files and then watching them pile up and pile up and pile up. And I had to buy more hard drives because these files were huge, you know, and I got really nervous. I just, I just one step at a time, one at a time, just chunks, 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 just take it bit by bit. And you can just hammer through almost anything. Just one at a time, one step at a time. I love the fact that it's really about finding efficiency, but also taking that initial fear and saying, hey, it's just a feeling and I'm just going to go for it. That's just what's going to get you to that hard challenge and then get you past it. So show you you can do it anytime. 
because the alternative is pretty awful. Absolutely. Steve, working with directors and editors, has your visual impairment been a help, a hindrance? How has it come up and how have they responded to you when they find out that you are visually impaired? This is something that I generally don't even bring up for as long as possible. And it's not out of fear. It's just it doesn't matter. One, because they're not writing the music, and so they're not really concerned about that I can't see to transcribe music. They don't care what my process is for music itself. At the end of the day, it's about the product. So so long as I can deliver, they could care less what's wrong with me, quote unquote, because at the end of the day, all they care about are the files you send them when they ask you to send them. And that's what I like about this business, as hardcore as it can be, as awful and and bitter and conniving as it can be. It can also be quite glorious and beautiful and uniting and celebratory and thrilling. They're, they're too busy telling their story to hear yours. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, that's what you want, right? You want to be part of it. You don't want them to be focusing on you. You want them to be focusing on what they do and you helping yeah. them do what they do better. Because what you're doing is you're selling yourself to them to work on their movie. It's about merit and what you do to achieve that type of um, reputation. That's your reputation as someone who's easy to work with, who is a great communicator, is friendly, who you want to be stuck in an editing bay with or on a mixing stage with, and who writes cool music for you that serves the story. That's that's all that matters. And then it comes out, oh, you happen to not see all that great. All right. Well, I guess I'll have someone pick you up at the airport. Um, it's It's here nor there. Because what you've done is you've established yourself as someone who has demonstrated competency, if not brilliance, for the sake of the greater good. And that's what people want. Steve, is there anything in the beginning of your career potentially related to your disability that you didn't know, that you wish you knew, and that has been helpful for you throughout your career? Knowing how many people there are out there that are willing to help you if you just ask. What I've learned through my years, especially in a support business, such as what we call post-production. So after the film's been shot, you know, it goes to be picture edited and music mixed and, and music for it. And what I learned was at the beginning was I was kind of afraid to ask a few questions here and there because I was so new, I was so green. But as I started to get on forums and, and talking with people, I, I noticed there wasn't a, necessarily a snarkiness when people asked a question. There would be snarkiness and fight back when people had a very sharp opinion, but that's what you get anywhere. But when people had questions, and when I started to reach out and ask questions, people were more than willing to assist me. And there could be several reasons for that, but what I learned was that this music community is a big family. As much as we're fighting for jobs, you know, uh, sometimes against each other, we really want to share our knowledge. Man, it feels so good to be surrounded by so many people who are like, oh, what's your problem with your computer? Let me help. Have you tried this? Have you tried that? And it's all because I just opened up and said, look, I'm new. I'm green. I, I have some questions. Can you help me? And more people will help me than not. So honestly, I wish I would have started to ask questions sooner. Yeah, you got to be willing to ask questions. Absolutely. You know, many young workers today feel stigmatized if they bring up their disability, as you've been talking about. They may feel that they don't even know how to talk about it. Do you have any advice for folks who are struggling with that issue? Here's the deal. The best part, or one of the best parts about having a challenge or being disabled is when you ask people to do stuff, what are they going to do? I mean, you're you're right in front of them. Here's the thing. It's a whole lot easier to tell somebody no over, the, over texting or over the phone than it is to their face. So like when I go shopping and I ask for help, people, I, you're only going to get two types of reactions 99.9% .9 of the time. You can get people who say, oh, you can't see you all. Sure. Yeah, here, follow me. I'll take you. I'll go grab it because they've done it before, they've seen it before, plus it feels good to help people. Remember, you're also helping them. Whether they want to admit it or not, you're also helping them because people like to feel good because they feel proud that day and they get to eat that cookie at the end of the day because they helped somebody out. Or the other version of them helping you is they are so dumbfounded as because they've never dealt with it that they are putty in your hands. 
in that instance, you have to know what to say and and what to share with them. And that comes through through confidence, through through speaking with friends. If you can't have open conversations with the closest people to you, how are you going to have it from a stranger who's looking to hire you? Which is why it's best to practice feeling good in your own skin. You have the responsibility to yourself to know how to ask what you need from family, from friends, and ask them to treat you equally. Steve, is there someone with a disability who you most respect? And if so, what can we learn from that person? There's two. The first person is my father, because my father, for a long time, was a pretty significant stutterer. Couldn't talk. And, and he wanted to be a preacher. So if you can imagine somebody getting up in front of a congregation who can't give you the sermon. He had to work incredibly hard to work on that stutter. And it was, it was hard for him, but it took him years to do, but he figured it out. When you hear him now, he doesn't stutter or stumble or stammer over any of his words whenever he's in front of a congregation. It's actually quite amazing. So, Holy Spirit, work it through my father. There you and, go. And uh, the other is a friend of mine who came into their disability late. Her name is Katie Wirth, and she's married to my best friend, Nick. She has Guillain barre and what Guillain barre is, it is like an autoimmune neuromuscular disease that removes your ability to move, essentially. You are paralyzed. Some people recover, and some people don't. She has had to, for years, learn how to walk, learn how to use her hands. For a while, she couldn't even hold her own baby. She was in her 30s when this happened. So she had 30 years of living and working and having a family and everything's great. And all of a sudden, surprise, she wakes up one morning and she can't move. And that was terrifying. And we were all very concerned and we all still are. But several years on, you know, after she went through a process of figuring out, okay, what the heck am I going to do? She couldn't work. And she had a whole lot of challenges. And Nick had a whole lot of challenges. And they still do. They still do because she still is experiencing this massive challenge that she didn't have a few years ago. And what did she do? She got a better job than the one she had before because there's no way in heck she was going to spend the rest of her life feeling sorry for herself. She went and got it and she did. And so she's making more money. She's happier with her position and she's considering moving to different areas. Um, but that came from hard work, hard work. And it's a, it's a challenge she will have probably for the rest of her life. And so I have kudos to her because she didn't have her entire life to get used to something. She got a big Christmas surprise in May that devastated her body and her family. So those are two people that I really look up to. And your confidence, I'm sure, in, in facing your own challenges and the kind of things we've been talking about here, I'm sure help keep her on the straight too as well. You know, one of the things I most admire about you, Steve, and just our short number of conversations is how confident you are despite all the challenges you have. So what's the growth moment that happened for you to help you to get to that point? Because you, you've got this ability to just see things for what they are and then just live life. When we're learning hard truths, the problem is it gets real sad sometimes learning hard truths because then we realize, you know what? Nobody does care about me as much as I care about myself. Nobody is going to be able to help me the way I need them to help me exactly the way I need them to. Nobody's going to do this. Nobody's going to do that for me. The world doesn't work like this. And the only sad part that will then stem from that after you realize that is what you then do with that to then say, hey, I know that nobody cares about me the way I do. So I got to work a little harder. Oh, I know this is how my friend Sophie uh, helps me. Okay, well, this is how she knows how to help me. So I know where she goes. And we build this, this collage, you know, and it's always moving. It's this moving collage of people, of personalities, and we know where to, how to ask them. And we get to then adjust based on the hard truths we learned in the first place. And that's pretty cool because most people who don't have a challenge might not ever learn this stuff. And so because we are forced 
to have to understand hard truths. That is nothing if not an opportunity to harness what that means and make that work for us. Our entire lives are based around making the way things can work for us so we can lead fulfilling lives with love, with friendship, with purpose, with drive, with clarity and peace of mind. That's beautiful. You know, Steve, one of the great things also about you is that you you really want to make a difference in other people's lives. And you're launching this awesome new project. Uh, I'd love to, for you to tell folks about it. Oh, yeah. there's a, It's a working title, folks, but it's called Blind Ambition Project. As I work in music and as I learned and as I've started to achieve certain levels of success, not all of them, but I've been able to work hard enough to get to a certain level in the industry and I continue to move forward. There are lots of exciting projects ahead. As I have discovered what has worked for me, I want to help others find what works for them. And for me, that comes through art and specifically through music. So uh, this Blind Music Project, uh, what I'm going to do or what I'm doing, I actually, actually, I learned this. You never, like, it's like in acting. It's, you don't talk about what you're trying to do or what you're going to do. It's always about what you're doing. And so what I am doing is putting together a project where I invite persons with sight challenges, and it will be more persons with different physical disabilities in the future, but I'm inviting persons with sight challenges who've got some musical chops But because of being on disability, not having the money, because a lot of us don't work, so we don't have money or a ton of it, and we don't have the connections, I want to bring in persons with sight challenges into a studio where I surround them with professional engineers, professional producers, professional studio musicians to bring their piece of music and pull out the life, the depth, the breadth of what is in their mind and put it into digital form to send out into the world. The thing is, we're going to, we're going to film it and we're going to build a documentary out of this. And I've got editors, I've got producers, I've got people all over the country, even some places around the world who have signed on to do this project. They're like, yes, this is a great idea. Because what I believe is that when you can achieve something, if in this instance, a song, an example of what you can do, and here's the crucial part, being a part of the decision-making process the entire way to then have a product at the end of the day that represents your vision in your mind that is now outside of yourself that not only did you craft behind a mic or behind a keyboard but you also sat in that booth with the engineers and discussed the decisions to make your song yours and that builds confidence and it's confidence through experience and once you have experience comes wisdom and the ability to understand hey I love this music thing. I want to continue this. Or it says, hey, I got this one music idea out. I'm really happy about this. I really like what I've done. But you know what I want to do next? Dot, dot, dot. You know, get people to a decision to where they want to go next. This is simply a stepping stone to see where you want to go. But I believe through the act of decision making and creation to establish a final product that you can then do what with what you will. And I, do, and I already have people in the industry who are interested in hearing this. We can talk about distribution. What would you like to do with your song? And there's a whole other area that you can be a part of discussing where this project goes, where your piece of music goes as we film it and we make a documentary out of this. And how do people get in touch with you and or find out more information if they're interested or if they know someone who might be a good fit for that project? Folks, just email me. Uh, my regular email address will be just fine. It's stephenletness at gmail.com. And that's S-T-E-P-H-E-N-L-E-T-N-E-S at gmail.com. My last name spells Nestle, N-E-S-T-L-E. L E T N E S. I love that. Steve, we've been talking a lot about disability and success. You've had a lot of awesome things to say. Any final thoughts on the topic for our listeners out there? You got to be busy. Find ways to reach out, get out, be involved. One of the biggest problems that we have that is as insidious as my macular degeneration is, is the creeping feeling of sedate comfort. The only, only reason why I have gotten anywhere in the entertainment business is because I got 
out of my place. And I went, I reached out, I connected, I contacted, I networked, I shook hands. You could be the best banjo player south of the Mason-Dixon line, but nobody's going to know it if you're stuck on your porch just playing the thing. You know, nobody's going to know the great orator that you are if you don't go out and give speeches. You know, being a public speaker, doing presentations, somehow you only get better at that. But your talent is not the first thing people look at. It's the third. It's the fourth first thing they look at after they know who you are is if you're a decent human being that they can spend time with, that you're kind, that 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 you want to think of solutions. And so that comes, that's just a part of the gig. But the only way to do that is if you get out and reach out to the people who know the people who know the people. You get out of your comfort zone and you get into other people's comfort zones. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you put that, getting into other people's comfort zones. I, I'm nervous saying this, but it's a difficult place to navigate when you're starting with a stacked deck. But that's okay, because what opportunity do we have in front of us than to think differently all the time? And that is a feature that people want in their workforce. How do directors want music in their film? They want somebody who's going to think about it differently. Because I'll tell you what, everybody else who seems to be writing for film is perfectly sighted. Apparently, I'm the only dude who's got low vision who's scoring films. So, like, I have something different to offer because wow, this is all about selling yourself. Okay, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I don't see all that great or I don't hear that well. But here's what I've done. Here's what I do in school. This is how I adjust because good managers, people who know how to hire people are looking for people who are going to help their business out. And what do we do but think differently all the time? We have to think out of the box all the time. And that is something that is special, that is wanted, that is needed, that is necessary, that people want around them. So honestly, as much garbage as we have to deal with for being challenged, disabled, whatever word you use, we got a chance to do things differently. And I think that's pretty cool. Steve, thank you so much for taking such an immense amount of your time out to speak to us and for sharing such great wisdom for us. Really look forward to chatting again. Thank you again for sharing all your thoughts. Hey, thank you so much, Jack. It was a pleasure speaking with you today. I look forward to doing it again. This concludes our conversation on success with film composer Steve Letness. Steve has shown us that not being afraid to ask for help when needed, not shying away from doing the hardest thing first because then you know you can do anything, and always saying yes to all the opportunities that come your way even if you're not quite sure that you can do it, have enabled him to achieve incredible success. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and that you've learned a tip or two for your own life. Join us next time for our conversation with CEO Sander Flom. A member of the board convinced the majority that stuttering is a mental illness, a form of mental illness. And we can't give the job to Sander. He can't be trusted. I decided, Jack, that I was going to be more successful than anybody there. Please feel free to contact Team Accelability to share your comments, questions, or feedback, or to share your own story with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find out more information about this podcast and other resources by visiting us at www.teamexcelability.com, on Facebook at Team Accelability, or on Twitter at Team Accelability. Thank you and have a blessed day.